Welcome to lesson 7.11. This lesson, this lesson focuses on herbivorous or plant parasitic nematodes. And in this case, we'll be talking about the root knot nematode in the genus Meloidogyne. Here is an image of a juvenile root knot nematode entering a tomato root. Okay, so let's jump into lesson 7.11. So nematodes in the Meloidogyne genus are sedentary endoparasites, and particularly the female is sedentary throughout its life cycle on the root system of the plant, and the losses of $100 billion US a year worldwide are attributed to Meloidogyne damage. That equates to about 5% average yield losses per year, and there are around 100 known species of Meloidogyne and Incognita, Javanica, Arenaria, and Hapla are the most common and most studied. There is a very wide distribution of the nematode across the world, and these animals are polyphagous, meaning that they will consume a wide variety of plants. There are only a few species that have a few host plants, but most will consume a wide range of plant species. They can cause serious crop damage, particularly in vegetables, and it is difficult in some tropical and subtropical developing countries to actually cultivate vegetables as a result of the severity of the infestation that can occur. These nematodes can affect the crop directly or interact with various soil-borne fungi, bacteria and viruses to further damage the plant. The image on the right shows the specific hook-like galls that are present on rice roots when infected with Melodogyne gramanicola. And here are just a couple of images showing peanut root knot nematode, Melodogyne arenaria, and three females of this species in a sectioned gold root system. And on the right we have the same species but of the second stage juveniles that is the infective stage of the nematode and it's invading a root tip here. So let's look at the Meloidogyne life cycle. We'll begin with the egg here and the developing first stage juvenile that molts within the egg and then when it hatches it's at its infective juvenile stage, the J2, and these guys are attracted to the growing roots that they will come to feed on. The J2 enters the root and migrates to the area of cell elongation within the roots. And once it has arrived at a suitable feeding site, it will inject its esophageal gland secretions into the root cells. And this will begin to form the giant cells. And we'll describe in the next slide exactly just what these cells are. But this is the place that the galls will grow as a result of cell swelling and cell multiplication. So the nematodes develop into J3s and J4s and the adult stages. So they'll go through several molts. And then the gall begins to form as a response to their feeding on these giant cells that are induced by the nematodes. The adult females will produce over a thousand eggs and males are unnecessary in most species but are sometimes needed for a production depending on the species. And the female will produce an egg sac to protect her eggs that she exudes to the outside of the root and these egg masses can be actually seen on the gold roots. And when the roots do have goals on them, they provide minimal resources for the rest of the plant. So all of the plant's energy is basically channeled into these galls. And of course, as the eggs develop, the nematodes will hatch and the cycle will begin again. So just to recap some of the important parts of the life cycle, these include the fact that the J2 is the infective stage and it enters near the root tip to migrate to the vascular cylinder of the plant and then establishes this feeding site in the vascular tissue in the endodermis or pericycle. So these are the areas where the plant puts its resources in order for the plant to grow. 
the cells around that tissue go through a repeated nuclear division as a result of the feeding of the nematodes and the exudates that force the plant to produce these giant cells that the nematode puts in by its stylet as it feeds. And this results in multinucleate cells. That means up to 100 nuclei being present within these giant cells. These cells are enlarged and have a dense cytoplasm and the several nuclei that are present ensures that there is increased metabolic activity in these cells in order to feed the nematodes. The joining cells also divide and that's called hyperplasia and also swell and that creates this root goal or root knot appearance. As the nematodes feed, they molt, so they move on from the second stage all the way to the fourth and then adult stage of their development. The males will leave the plant and enter the soil and move on to infect other roots. And the saccate or the pear-shaped females put out this gelatinous egg mass to protect their eggs. The tropical species Meloidogyne, Incognita, Javanica and Arenaria are parthenogenetic, so that means they don't need a male in order to fertilize their eggs. But there are some species that do require sexual reproduction, so males are necessary in the reproduction of those species. And there might be seven to eight generations per year. This is an image of a first stage juvenile, so J1, in its eggshell. So let's look at the feeding of these nematodes, because this is an interesting interaction between the host plant and the nematode. When the nematode injects its stylet into the plant, it delivers esophageal gland secretions into the plant tissue. And these substances regulate the plant's gene expression. So the plant is susceptible to these signals from the secretions of the nematode to actually express its genes in a particular way as to form these feeding cells to ensure nematode nutrition. So there is a nematode plant cell signal exchange and this causes several molecular events and these cause cellular changes and these lead to polyploid nuclei, so that means nuclei that have more than two chromosome sets, with transfer cell-like structures within the giant cell. This increases the feeding site metabolic capacity, so these giant cells become metabolic sinks in the plant, and this ensures constant nutrient supply to the nematodes, but the result of that is that the plant suffers nutritionally because all of its resources are now going to feed the nematode. This is a beautiful scanning electron micrograph of a female Meloidogyne species, showing the saccate or the pear-shaped form that the female takes on. So the symptoms of this feeding behavior of Meloidogyne on its host plants include galling, carrot forking, such as can be seen on the right here, potato tubercules forming, so different aberrations of the root system, various types of dysmorphia within the root systems of the affected plants. This is also associated with low yields, a general mineral deficiency within the plant, stunting of the plant's growth, yellowing, wilting and chlorosis of the leaves, and premature leaf shedding as well as disease susceptibility. So the plants become more susceptible, obviously, to other organisms such as fungi and bacteria, as well as viruses, overall causing yield reduction. Of course, there are various ways to manage root knot nematodes. And since the Industrial Revolution, nematicides have been used in the form of bare root dipping and seed and nursery bed treatment in order to protect young seedlings. So this is mostly in vegetable crops. There are also fumigants that can be applied before planting, and these are pretty horrific chemicals that are very destructive to all the life forms within the soil. Furthermore, broad-spectrum fumigants can be used, and these are nervous system toxins, 
And these, of course, are being phased out because they are so severely dangerous to human and animal health as well as many other life forms. So they are being phased out and there are various other methods now being developed in order to control these nematodes in the field. And it is very sad that these animals are being so terribly treated because they are quite beautiful animals. This is a face shot of Nalaidogai natalei and it's got this beautiful Fibonacci arranged mouth parts. And many of these nematodes actually have very attractive faces. <laughs> and also these animals are very necessary in the ecosystem. So these are not just horrible ugly pests. These are animals that have been designed to be an essential in an integral part of the soil ecosystem. But because we have created conditions for them to overthrive, we are suffering the consequences of that. And that is not the nematode's problem. It is a problem of exploitation of the soil ecosystem. So what are other ways to control this sinning pest? Well, there are very few resistant vegetable crops and these organisms are polyphagous, so they feed on multiple species of different plants. So it is very difficult to actually plant resistant varieties within the field. So the only thing that farmers can really hope for is to reduce the infestation to below economic damage level. And some of the ways that this is done is at the detriment of the soil ecosystem via, for example, two to three summer plows at 20 centimeter depth, which is quite deep, and at 15 day intervals. So very much geared to expose all the nematodes as well as weeds and pathogen propagules and insect pests to sun rays. So basically solarizing the soil by turning it and totally destroying the soil structure as well. And this is very detrimental to the entire soil ecosystem and therefore actually produces even more problems than it's designed to mitigate. Another similar detrimental method is through field flooding and solarization. So two extremes. Basically, flooding will create anaerobic conditions, which, yes, they will kill the nematodes, but soils that are anaerobic actually increase nematode occurrence. So even though initially the nematodes are killed off, the conditions which are created through this method further support the reproduction and proliferation of the nematodes. Solarization requires a lot of plastic to be put down, so there's a lot of plastic waste and it's expensive, and at the same time it's going to cause destruction of the soil life that is present within the soil, not just the nematodes. Growing cover crops is a much better method particularly when antagonistic plants are grown, such as marigold, for example, that actually produce toxins that the nematodes do not appreciate. Another good method is crop rotation with resistant varieties or non-host crops. But this really requires one to really know what those hosts are. But once again, there are particular varieties of crops that the nematodes do not prefer, such as mustard, sesame, maize, wheat. And some of these varieties actually do have resistance in them and therefore using them in crop rotation will reduce the nematode numbers within the soil. The use of organic manure and farmyard manure at between 18 to 20 tons per hectare has been shown to increase crop tolerance and allow for the proliferation of microbial antagonists. And this is something we'll talk about in more depth in a minute. In the image on the right, we have an adult male in the roots. And of course, everything is stained in this image. Obviously, these animals are not pink in color and neither is the root. But just to show how the nematode is exiting a root that it has just been feeding on. So several species of fungi and bacteria are known to control the nematode. And that includes some of the species we've already described, such as Arthrobotrys robustus, and it's been developed into products that you can actually purchase. And this also includes Arthrobotrys irregularis and another species called Herpuriocilium lilacinus. There are other fungi as well that control these nematodes that have been studied and can have some effect when used. 
And also there are bacteria, Pseudomonas fluorescens, for example, and Pasteria penetrans, and these are used as a potentially effective biological control of root knot nematodes. The image on the right is a scanning electron micrograph of a female Meloid belgine species. So by far the best method of controlling or suppressing these nematodes is to have a suppressive soil. So a soil that naturally has biological control, just like in a healthy ecosystem where everything functions in unison and supports one another. So in an agricultural system, we should have soils that are healthy and thriving in the sense of biological activity. So it is known that reduced biological activity within soils increases proliferation of the root knot nematode. So Graham Sterling has done a lot of work on this in Australia, and he has shown that organic matter increase increases microbial activity and predators. He's found that increasing carbon to nitrogen ratio of the organic matter will feed fungi and therefore provide a system where fungi and predators proliferate and significantly increase soil suppressiveness. So basically fungal dominant soils will increase fungal feeding omnivore and predator nematodes and this significantly reduces the proportion of meloidogyne in the soil and particularly because the predators will also use meloidogyne as a food source. So in some of the experiments, Graham has used sugarcane trash at 12.5 tons per hectare and sorghum crops as mulch. And sorghum contains and releases hydrogen cyanide, which acts as a biofumigant against the nematodes. And with this application, it was found that there was an increase in beneficial nematodes, a reduction in root knot nematodes, galling, and pythium root rot disease as well. It has also been shown that reducing tillage to minimum increases organic matter in the soil. So basically all the practices that enhance organic matter will provide more food for all the microbial life forms, particularly leading to a more fungal dominated soil ecosystem. And given that many fungi love to consume nematodes, this makes sense. And this in itself has the effect of suppressing meloidogyne and allowing it to fit into the ecosystem more naturally without having an overgrowth of this one species where it becomes detrimental to the plant health. So obviously any methods that will increase plant health and nutrient cycling are also going to have a positive effect on reducing or controlling or just simply allowing meloidogyne to be a part of the ecosystem as it should without it being in an imbalance as is the case in meloidogyne infested fields. The image on the right is that of stained egg masses of Texas root knot nematode meloidogyne haplonaria on the roots of a tomato cultivar, which actually is resistant to the southern root knot nematode. So we have come to the end of lesson 7.11, and in our next lesson, We'll talk about the last of the most economically important herbivorous or plant parasitic nematodes called the root lesion nematode in the genus Pratolinchus. Okay, so you'll be hearing from me again in lesson 7.12. Bye for now.